another application of the tunneling theory. This time we actually made it into a device. Okay, it's got a tunneling, it's got scanning, tunneling, microscope, or STM. This thing is incredible. With this microscope, we are able to map out here, you see this picture. This this is a computer generated picture of the STM imaging of the surface of graphite. You can almost see individual atoms. You see this uh, hexagonal structure of, of, of graphite. We'll see that in we'll, we'll discuss that in the next chapter. You can actually see the uh, the uh, how the uh, atoms are arranged. This is the detail you can see. Incredible. How does this thing work? Scanning, tunneling, microscope. What does scanning mean? What does tunneling mean here? Well, here's the thing. I want to look at the surface arrangements. Okay, the surface arrangements of atoms on a conducting material such as graphite. I want to know how the surface uh, atoms on the surface are laid out. So here's what I do. I have a device. Okay, I have a conducting conducting piece of of, of, of crystal and it moves at an extremely slow rate right above the surface right above the surface I have to move atom by atom by atom by atom and the way I precisely control this movement I cannot just use you know I just push it because that, that's you cannot control the size of an atom so what you do is you have to use what's called piezoelectric crystal The piezoelectric crystal is a type of crystal which will experience volume change as you apply a positive or negative potential on it. And by applying, by varying the potential smoothly, you can change the size of the crystal smoothly down to the size of atoms. Okay, so basically here you have a conducting tip. And then this is a piece of uh, piezoelectric crystal. You mount the conducting tip on the crystal and we apply a voltage to expand or shrink the crystal so that makes this tip move with atomic precision. This is called scanning. So we're going to move along this line and as it moves along this line, the tip sometimes gets pretty close to the atom, sometimes gets pretty far from the atom, right? And uh, you put a current loop here, okay? You can measure the current. Now the current normally should be zero because there is an air gap between here and there. But remember, there is a tunneling effect. So you can think of this as a potential barrier. The uh, electron can actually tunnel through with finite amplitude. And this amplitude depends exponentially on the width of this gap, right? This width and that width. There is an exponential difference between the tunneling rate here and the tunneling rate there. And the tunneling rate is directly proportional to what? To the current that you gather. Right, to the current get that you get. So by measuring this current, we can s we can find how this gap varies, how this width varies, and this gives you a profile on the surface, how close this tip is to the surface of these atoms. So that's go up and down, up and down, up and down. And then after you scan this line, I want you to move over to here to scan another line, and then move over and scan another line, and move over to scan another line. After many, many scans, use a computer to generate this 2D image of the surface arrangement of this particular type of, uh, type of uh, um, material. And that is how scanning tunneling microscope works. Again, the uh, key idea is that this tunneling current is an exponential function of how close you are between the tip and the surface of the atom. And uh, um, you may wonder, what kind of atomic size tip we're going to get? Right? How do we manufacture a tip that's the size of an atom? No, we don't. We don't have to do that. We do it naturally because the materials, whatever material you use, the conducting tip itself has, you know, up, uh, has ups and downs. Right? It's not smooth on the atomic side. And suppose you get something like this. Then this guy, being the, sh the longest one out, is the one actually we use. Those ones are exponentially smaller in terms of the current they produce, so I don't care. It is this tip that we actually use. It's a natural tip. We don't have to manufacture it. We cannot cut it down to the size of an atom we don't need to. Okay, so this is how scanning tunneling microscope works. As the last example of chapter 41, let's take a look at what happens when we go beyond one dimension. Here is our problem number 50 in the textbook. And we use that example to show you what happens 
when you try to solve Schrodinger's equation beyond one dimension. Here is Schrodinger's equation in one dimension. And if you go beyond one dimension, we learned how to, how to rewrite this. This di second derivative with respect to x now becomes gradient squared, which is the sum of the three second derivatives, right? This is the Laplace operator, partial, 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 right? So let's apply the three-dimensional Schrodinger's equation to solve this sample problem. This is one of the easiest ones to solve, but even with the easiest one, you can see some new physics, which is the important thing. I have a three-dimensional box in which I trap a particle. This three-dimensional box has three sizes, A, B, and C. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional infinite square well, basically. How do we solve this problem? Well, the key idea is the so-called separation of variables. We did that before, when we separated the, the time dependency and the space dependency of the Schrodinger's equation. Right? We arrived at what's called stationary Schrodinger's equation, when u is not a function of time. Okay, we do the same thing here. We further separate the x, y, and z dependency of the wave function, of the, of the stationary part of the wave function, separately into products. So we assume that this psi, r, the space part of the wave function, can be written as the, as the product of psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. Psi 1 depends only on x, psi 2 only on y, and psi 3 only on z. Now, there is no guarantee that this works, okay? But let's hope for the best. How do we know it's right or wrong? We plug this into what? Into the three-dimensional Schrodinger's equation, right? To see if it actually works. So let's do that. Um, when you solve Schrodinger's equation in three dimensions, you have to deal with this gradient squared. So let's look at what happens when you apply gradient squared on our new separated variables, psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. So let's do that. Okay, there are three terms in gradient squared. Here is x derivative, y derivative, and z derivative. Now when you do the x derivative, you notice that psi 2 and psi 3, depending on y and z, are just constants, right? You take them out, psi 2, psi 3. You differentiate only with respect to psi 1 twice for x. Same thing. The next term, you take psi 1, psi 3 out, only differentiate with respect to psi 2, because that's the only that depends on y. Okay. The next term, similar idea. So let's plug this into this three-dimensional Schrodinger's equation, which I'm going to write down here again. Psi squared psi equals e minus u psi. Okay, gradient squared psi already did that. That's right here. So that is what I get. Okay, that is what I get. Uh, so what I want to do now is you notice that in this gradient psi, uh, gradient squared, I psi 2 psi 3, psi 1 psi 3, psi 1 psi 2, each term is a mixture of x, y, and z. Okay in order to get rid of multiple variable dependency. For this term, for example, how do I get rid of the dependency on psi, one, uh, psi 2 and psi 3? I divide it off, OK? I divide it off and divide it off. But I don't want to divide it off by different things, so I'm going to divide it off by the entire psi. I'm going to divide each term of the Schrodinger's equation by psi 1 times psi 2 times psi 3. And if you did that for the first term, what do you get? So divided by psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, only psi 1 survives. You see that? Psi 2 and psi 3 gone. When you divide this whole thing by psi, then you get psi 1 gone, psi 3 gone, you only get psi 2. Same thing for the third term, only psi 3 survives in the numerator, in the denominator. So I have, this is the kinetic energy part. I broke the kinetic energy part into three terms, okay, 1, 2, and 3. The other side was e minus u times psi, and now psi is divided off, so it's just e minus u. Now, what about this u? What is it equal to? u is equal to infinity outside, but that is where psi equals 0. I already know that. I don't care. I only care about what happens inside, okay? Inside was u. 0, okay? u is equal to 0 inside. It's just a box, okay? And so it's a constant. It's the total energy E, whatever it is. It's a constant. And this constant is actually equal to the sum of these three terms. And this is a function of x only, function of y only, function of z only. Now, somehow, you add them together, you get a constant. And this equation is valid for any values of x, y, and z. So let's say, for example, let's say I fix y and z. Okay, so this term will not change because I fixed y, and this term will not change, and I'll fix z. But I'm going to change x. Normally, when you change x, the first term changes, right? Because it's a function of x, right? But 
can it really change? No, not in this case, because look, Y didn't change, Z didn't change, and even as you didn't change, nothing else changed. If this thing changes as X changes, you're going to introduce a contradiction. Okay, you vary this term, none, none of the other terms change, you're going to, you're going to, you know, throw off the equation. So what did that tell us? It tells us that what whatever X changes, this term cannot change either, because you did not change Y and Z. So as X changes, this thing doesn't. It is a constant, okay? Simli similarly, this is also a constant, and this is also a constant. Each of the three terms must be a separate constant. So what is that constant equal to? Well, actually, cross that, you, you get zero. The sum of the three constants equals what? Equals E. So might as well call this E1, this E2, and this E3. Right? So I have successfully separated this one single equation into three separate equations, one for x, one for y, one for z. And uh, here is these three equations when I write them down. This first equation for psi 1, second for psi 2, third one for psi 3. And uh, let me repeat the derivation for uh, starting from here for psi 1. I rewrite this as negative k1, and here's k1. Right? Remember, this is e1. Okay, this is k1. And, uh, um, you know, uh, this is the x dependency. And uh, if it's a box of length a between 0 and x equal to 0 and x equal to a, then you must have a sine function starting from x because it has to be 0 at x equal to 0. And it also has to be 0 at x equals l. I'm sorry, x equal to a because that's where the edge of the box is. So k1 times a for the sine function must equal to n1 pi. This is the same as we derived for one dimensional infinite square well. The same exact thing. Okay, I must use introduce a k1 and n1 here because I don't want to mix it with uh, the y and z direction. So I have here the same solution as I had before for the one dimensional uh, infinite, infinite square well. A replaces L. This is the width in the x direction. N1 replaces N, okay? But it's still just an, just an integer, one, two, three, four, and so on. And here's what E1 is, because you know what K is, therefore you can find what E1 is. Similarly, you can find what happens to Y, what happens to Z, just similar equations. Okay, for example, for, for psi 2, I get 2 over B, right? And then sine of N2 pi over B times Y, not X, and so on. Now, the wave function is the product of all three wave functions, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. And you see here, that's the product, okay? Here is the overall uh, normalization constant. Is the, it is the product of all three constants, so the square root of 2 over a times square root of 2 over b times square root of 2 over z uh, uh, over c. That's what you got. v is a times b times c. That's volume of the box. This is normalization. And uh, then you have the product of psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. And e is e1 plus e2 plus e3, so that's that. So here is our new result. We got it without too much struggle because we had a key idea, and that is to separate the variables into different functions and uh, just uh, work out these functions separately and look at the new physics we got. Instead of one quantum number, I have three quantum numbers. There's a blue one for x, for x direction, there's a green one for the y direction, and there's a red one for the z direction. The energy is still quantized, but it depends on three quantum numbers, n1, n2, and n3. That is a general idea, and that is when you go beyond one dimension, you're going to have two or three quantum numbers depending on whether you're working on two or three dimensions. Each dimension has its own quantization condition. That makes sense. In fact, in the next chapter, we'll be dealing with atoms and molecules. These are naturally three-dimensional entities, right? So we'll be dealing with three quantum numbers instead of only one. And the ground state is where the energy is the lowest, right? The energy is the lowest. And uh, how do you make energy lowest? You get n1, n2, n3 all equal to 1. That's the lowest possible value. Okay, There's only one set of numbers, n1, n2, n3. They're all equal to 1. So that's 1, 1, 1. That is the ground state. Now, interesting things happen when you try to find what is the first excited state. The first excited state. In general, a, b, c are not equal to each other. Okay, for the first excited state, you want to elevate one of these three from one to two, right? You don't want to elevate both of them because that's even higher energy. So 
Do you want one, one, two, one, two, one, or two, one, one? Those are three candidates, right? Which one has the lowest energy? Okay, which one has the lowest energy? Well, that depends on the values of A, B, and C, the, the, the width on the three dimensions. In fact, what you we want is to, is to choose a value two on uh, A or B or C, which has what? Which has the largest value, right? Then with that one, the, 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 the reciprocal is not that large. So even if you change it into the two, it doesn't really matter. So if A is the largest of the three dimensions, you want N1 to be two. And so you want to choose this. OK, so that's the first excited state. Um, and it's also, in this case, suppose A is the longest, and B and C are shorter, but they're not equal to each other, then this is the only possibility for the first excited state. There is one wave function for ground state, one wave function for the first excited state, if A, B, C are different in width. Now, here is the new physics we're dealing with, the issue of degeneracy. Degeneracy here means what? It means it is possible sometimes to for us to find more than one wave function, which will give you the same energy. Okay, so that means there are several different states. They are described by several different wave functions, but they have the same energy. Okay, if for example there are three states corresponding to the same energy, we say this energy level is threefold degenerate. Threefold degenerate. The ground state is never degenerate. It always has only one choice, n1, n2, n3 equal to 1. The degeneracy in this case happens when, for example, a and b are equal. If a and b are equal, then, for example, I can take 1, 2, or 2, 1. That's the same thing, right? The energy is the same, right? But these are two different states, though. When n1 equals 1, n n2 equal to 2, or n2 equal to 1, n1 equal to 2, these are different states with different wave functions and yet they have the same energy so you see when a equal to b you have degeneracy or worse yet if all are equal a b c are all equal then you have even greater amount of degeneracy you can have one two one you know one two one 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 two uh uh and you know two one one they're all the same right because it doesn't matter which one you, you put as two they're all the same a b and c are equal to each other and this gives some idea where degeneracy comes from degeneracy is is a concept when you have to go beyond one dimension and you can see here the more they are equal to each other these parameters the greater the amount of degeneracy and therefore degeneracy comes from symmetry what does symmetry mean symmetry means the setup is such that when you change certain things in the system the system is left unchanged if a and b are equal to each other okay they have equal widths then you rotate the system about x, y axis. x becomes y, y becomes x. You still have the same box, don't you? You didn't change anything, right? And that is a symmetry. And this symmetry leads to degeneracy because that means n1, n2, you can exchange them, you get the same, uh, you get the same energy, but different wave function. So this is the uh, origin of degeneracy. It comes from the symmetry of the problem. So that has been a long, long chapter where we introduce some basic ideas of quantum mechanics. We look at Schrodinger's equation and the wave function, which is the solution to the Schrodinger's equation, and what the wave function can tell us. And then we look at the examples of the solution to the Schrodinger's equation, mostly in one dimension, for both the bound state and the unbound state. For the bound state, energy is quantized because of boundary conditions. For unbound or scattering state, there is no quantization of energy but we can still have conservation of charge, uh, conservation of particles, so the, f the, the flow, flow rate uh, satisfied T plus R equals 1. And we also look at some applications, like resonance tunneling, like, uh, uh, like uh, alpha particle decays, that sort of thing. And this is just the beginning of our study into the microscopic world. In fact, uh, in the next chapter, we're going to study some more practical aspect of quantum mechanics. We're going to apply Schrodinger's equation to study the behavior of atoms and molecules.